you know, full of energy into the system, which the system is then collecting and using. Primary requirements, it has to be an open system. It has to have an external source of energy to furnish the energy that we're going to use. And therefore, it's no more mysterious than a windmill. And now we're coming full circle and realizing that uh, physics and metaphysics, that um, some of the notions of the 19th century, such as the ether and the vortex, are now being dusted off. And those ideas are being melded with uh, modern experiments, plus quantum mechanics and so forth, into this magnificent, uh, magnificent synthesis of what I call sacred science, of a whole new science, a whole new physics in which consciousness remains or reigns supreme. And where we don't have to follow any particular guru or a leader or anything like that, that we have everything we need in the universe that's ours to have right now. And these are some of the basic essence principles that lie underneath the discovery of free energy. The force of inertia is known in mechanics, but until only recently, it had been considered too weak and difficult to harness for propulsion. According to some theorists, like Hal Puthoff, inertia, like gravity, is what occurs when we try to accelerate an object against the zero-point fluctuations in the vacuum. We run into resistance, literally. Canadian inventor Roy Thornson has developed an inertial impulse propulsion engine which overcomes that resistance using centrifugal force. It pushes against nothing and emits no exhaust, but it's been calculated to be 20 times more efficient than a jet engine. Here, the Thornson inertial propulsion drive powers a canoe in a swimming pool. The motor, which is housed in a box, never contacts the water or air. In the pendulum test, unidirectional force is being generated to keep the pendulum to one side. Whether or not uh, we can demonstrate, as I have, with engineering analysis and um, and models that will climb and incline will pass us a pendulum test, in other words, stay on one side of the pendulum consistently, and even power a canoe in a swimming pool. Commercialization of that device is still a, a very difficult road. And we see that in many inventions. But what I like to emphasize is my F over P uh, measurement of that is literally 20 times better than the jet engine. A jet engine, typically a commercial jet engine, um, the DC-9, I think, is the one that I analyzed, has about 0.016 newtons per watt. And in the, this is in the metric system. Now, when we look at the Thornson, he's able to achieve 0 0.3, 0 0.32 newtons per watt, literally 20 times better than the uh, jet engine. Roy Thornson is developing refinements to his system to increase its performance. Unfortunately, like many inventors, even with a U.S. patent in hand, he has yet to find sufficient investment capital to bring his motor to the marketplace. Propulsion source does in fact exist. We've all seen these little toy gizmos that demonstrate lightning in a bottle. It's the electric phenomenon called plasma discharge. Various inventors, working independently, are coming up with some exotic combinations of gases, metals, and processes to actually squeeze excess electrical energy out of this phenomenon of nature. In 1996, Paolo and Alexandra Correa received the first patent for such a device called the Pulsed Abnormal Glow Discharge Reactor, the first of its kind to convert plasma discharge directly into electricity. This is a standard. Utah inventor Paul Pantone has developed what he calls the GEET fuel processor, 
a plasma generator similar to a super carburetor that actually appears to run on 80% water and is entirely non-polluting. This device replaces the carburetor and exhaust and combines them as one unit, whereas this end of it acts as a miniature refinery, allowing the engine to run on everything from battery acid and water mixed to crude oil right out of the ground. This is Angola crude, a 39.5 gravity. The exhaust coming down goes around and comes out here at the far end. The center chamber draws some of the heat from the exhaust, plus this tube takes some of the exhaust gases, takes them up into the chamber, and bubbles them down to the bottom. The bubbles, as it comes through the fuel, are brought up to the top of the chamber, picked up through a tube, and fed up the center of the exhaust pipe. While they're being fed up the exhaust pipe, they are in a vacuum, and there's a heat exchange which occurs. This process has been argumented argued a few times uh, to be either a plasma field, an electro field. We do know that it does have a slight radiation, which is not alpha, beta, or gamma. And we do have x-rays to show that whatever is coming from the unit does get affected different from stainless steel than uh, the pro regular steel. Yep. temperature of the exhaust is the same as the air temperature going in from the air portion up here. Normally one, three percent more oxygen coming out of the tailpipe than there is in the air we're breathing. And no carbon at all. Carbon vanishes. I wouldn't say vanishes, I would say transmuted into some other substance, a lighter element, because we have an abundance of lighter elements here that are not explained from down here. But during the heat process, uh, there are molecular changes. After running this engine from 1983 until now, and many times we had it running eight, eight, eight and a half hours a day, uh, we have never had to change the spark plug, change the oil, or clean it. We have taken the head off three times to inspect the inside of it, and it's been spotless. What we have here is the Pantone GEAT device fitted to a Ford 2300cc four-cylinder engine. As you can see, we had we have a, a see-through container here, which holds the fuel. As the engine is started, air is drawn in by vacuum through the fuel and bubbles the fuel. The vapors of which are drawn off here. They travel down this hose into our reaction chamber. They go up the reaction chamber and return back out here to be intake, to be taken into the engine through this tube. This is our air filter, and this tube is connected to another valve, which are controlled by this linkage, operating the air intake and the fuel intake. This is the valve that controls the return air going through this tube into the bowler.